will be by Alison. He will also give another lecture tomorrow, and it will see in between Victorian particle physics. That's right. That's right. With with a little bit of cosmology. Uh, hello, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, I am happy to be back here at TASI. I was at TASI in 2010, and I loved it. And uh, it was a wonderful month, and I learned a lot. And I know that by week four, I was very tired. I don't know if you guys are tired, but I was certainly very tired. Uh, you may have met my student, Tian. I told Tian before he came here that uh, he's going to be tired. And I asked him yesterday when I arrived, are you tired? And he looked at me and he said, I'm not tired, I'm still young. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm tired. Tom is tired. Um, I'm tired because I'm jet lagged. But anyways, so I know it's week four. Uh, I am, as Miriam said, going to be talking about the interface of string theory, particle physics, and cosmology. Uh, what I'm going to try to do since it's week four is to try to give you four stories. Uh, the stories are going to each have a sort of formal bit that leads in a phenomenological or cosmological direction. And uh, part of the reason is to give you an overview of, of some of the ways that are useful to think about particle physics and cosmology in the context of string theory. Another is, is because if you get tired during one of those stories and decouple, you can recouple when the next story begins. So uh, one thing that uh, I, I should mention is though there is this formal to phenomenological track I'm going to be taking with, with each one of these little stories, uh, like you, like many of you, I sometimes work on things that are just formal. And when I was postdocing, one of the things that was funny about that is I was working on something that was formal. And one uh, of my friends that was visiting KITP at the time, uh, a senior person in our field, he looked at me and he said, is it correct? And I was a little flabbergasted because uh, is it correct isn't a question we normally get asked. I thought to myself, does he think I don't know how to do the calculation? Did I make a math error? And what he meant is, is it realized in nature, right? Which is a different notion of correct than sometimes what we talk about with our formal work. So uh, the talk, the question that I want to ask sort of in this set of two lectures is, what if string theory was correct? <laughs> is correct. And, you know, most of us to the question, are you a string theorist, would, would say yes. And uh, this is the question that I sort of want to organize uh, this set of lectures around. I, I should mention at the beginning that if you have questions, feel free to email me. So uh, I get the impression that uh, what I'm going to talk about briefly here at the beginning to tell you what I mean by string remnants, uh, that, that the intro to that hasn't really been talked that much about. Cumberland talked about it a bit, but it has not been an extensive uh, set of this particular TASI yet, and that's the landscape. And some people love the landscape. Some people think that landscape is a dirty word that shouldn't be mentioned. Uh, and lots of people mean different things by the landscape. And so to start, I would like to, in thinking about the landscape, talk about the axis of possible things that people mean by the landscape organized according to boldness or maybe uh, controversialness. If that's a word. So there's a lot of different things that people mean by the string landscape. Uh, and I'm going to start here at the bottom with sort of very, very simple things. Namely, that when you compactify string theories and you consider the set of consistent string backgrounds, there's many possibilities. OK? So that's one sort of notion uh, uh, that people might mean. And in particular, when we talk about this, uh, many for me here means so many that maybe it's so many that we can't actually put it on a computer and access all of them in a reasonable amount of time. OK, so that's what I mean by many here. But there's a stronger notion, rather than just many possible backgrounds to consider, uh, people might mean that there are many uh, metastable de Sitter vacua, which, of course, is a stronger notion than this vague notion here. I'm running out of room, so I'll squash it a little bit. Another thing that people might mean is that not only do we have possibilities that could lead to many metastable de Sitter vacua, but 
cosmologically, there could be many pockets that populate the different vacua, or in particular, a multiverse. I'm really running out of room. I have two more lines. Uh, whether this happens or not doesn't really condition on whether the anthropic principle is a good idea. So sometimes people might consider a partially anthropic multiverse. And finally, as I'm running out of room, I will uh, say that some people like to resort to the anthropic principle uh, and have a mostly anthropic multiverse, <laughs> which is some sort of strong, strong, uh, strong notion of anthropic that I'm not going to go into. OK, so um, if you talk to enough people over a long enough period of time, uh, and I've talked to a lot of people about this, people mean lots of different things by, by landscape. And I think it's safe to say that um, I, I'd be curious to hear whether there's other things that, I, that I'm missing, but whether there's lots of possibilities or whether those lots of possible backgrounds lead to many metastable de Sitter vacua, and whether that, the cosmology on that landscape of many metastable de Sitter vacua leads to a multiverse where anthropics may or may not be a good idea or it may be a really good idea, this is not something we know the answer to. And I'm not going to try to tackle it here, and people have uh, very, very strong opinions about this, and there are lots of interesting things to talk about. Uh, but, but not here. One of the things that I want to talk about in this lecture is what do all of these things have in common? When we talk about the landscape, regardless of which of these notions is correct, and I should say that I think at the very least in 2017, we have to admit to ourselves that there are many possibilities. The idea that we're somehow going to be down lower on this axis, I don't think is really viable given what we know about string theory. So um, the thing that I want to talk about is something that ties all of this together that can arise in all of these contexts, regardless of which one is correct. And that's string remnants. So uh, I stole this phrase from my collaborator, Paul Langaker. I am not going to talk about black holes. I've gotten that question from a couple people. Is that what I, what I meant by remnants? What a string remnant is, is some low energy degree of freedom from the UV theory not introduced to solve a problem. Okay. So that's what I mean by string remnants. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is show you that there are some things that happen in string theory quite regularly uh, that are low energy degrees of freedom that might change how you think about particle physics or cosmology that could in some cases be testable, in other cases they're not. But in particular, these are just remnants of the UV construction. They're just things that string theory gives you regardless of whether or not you like it. And you have to learn how to deal with it. You have to learn whether it constrains you. You have to learn whether it's something really interesting to think about in light of current experiments. Uh, but they're low energy degrees of freedom from the ultraviolet theory not introduced to so solve some particular problem. <coughs> so of course, I have specific examples in mind. Maybe I'll put the outline of my talk on this other side here. OK, so I'm going to give you, as I told you, four little stories or vignettes of this idea. Uh, they're going to be in different contexts in string theory. The first is going to be in F theory. Thank you, Timo, for introducing this. I'm going to tell you about something called a non hibsable cluster. And uh, in particular, these have large gauge sectors. And the question is, are they interesting dark gauge sectors? I'm, uh, I'm tall, so I can ro raise it up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to tell you in the context of everywhere, these happen all over the place about axions. Axions are everywhere in string theory. They can be constraining if there are too many of them that are light in the stabilized theory. They're interesting uh, inflationary candidates. They're interesting dark matter candidates. Axions are everywhere in string theory. Also in the context of everywhere, this is more if time permits. I'm definitely going to get to four, but I may not get to three. Our moduli. 
String theory has extra dimensions. The extra dimensions have metric fluctuations that show up in the low energy theory as scalar fields that get stabilized. You know how the story goes, but how does cosmology change if you have all of those light degrees of freedom in the theory? And finally, I'm going to, in the context of weakly coupled orientifolds, though what I am going to say here applies elsewhere as, wh as well, orientifolds, I'm going to talk about the endless standard model exotics. And in particular, I want to talk about how consistency conditions in string theory can give rise to beyond the standard model exotics in the language of n equals one for, uh, dimensions and for, uh, n equals one theories and four dimensions. What I mean is extra chiral supermultiplets charged under the standard model or MSSM gauge group. And, and, and so the, this is the outline. All right. So that's up there for you to see. I'll try not to erase this one. Very thick chalk on this board. Uh, and let's start into F theory. So, oh, and I should say that look for the flow in this case, because I think it's a useful flow for how you think hard about formalism and how this formalism can, can lead to remnants and in particular ideas in particle cosmology, loosely defined. All right. Any questions at this point? This is just outline. All right. Okay. So I'm starting off in F theory. I'm going to tell you about something called a non Higgsable cluster. This is the formalism. And uh, the question is, uh, do these give rise to interesting or uh, phenomenologically disastrous dark gauge sectors? And the jury is still out on that question. Yeah. Um, there's a number of comments I'd like to make about what I'm about to tell you before I get into it. One is that I'm going to introduce a notion of generic here. It was already raised in Timo's lecture yesterday. Uh, I'll say this again in a second, but remember in this Weierstrass equation, there are these polynomials F and G that control the locations and structure of the seven brains and the gauge sectors. And you can ask the question, if you consider the most general set of monomials that might appear in that, in one of those polynomials, and you put down totally arbitrary coefficients without making any tunings or choices or whatnot, what is the general structure that the space gives you uh, with respect to the gauge sector? Uh, one, one thing that's true about this story is that it seems that there's a strong correlation between strong coupling and, and this phenomenon. It's not really known quite yet whether it's just correlation or causation, but uh, it's, it's true in nearly all of the examples, uh, which, which, is, which is interesting. Uh, this is also part of the story about how as you move sort of into the M theory star, are you starting to see things that you might not have seen at weak coupling? This is one of the great advantages, I think, of F theory for these sorts of questions, because uh, while studying corners of the landscape is great, what we want to do is be able to make the, the broadest statements we can, really. And moving away from weak coupling is, is one good way to do that. Uh, Timo has also introduced this notion of the extra dimensional space B. So if you want to have an F theory compactification, you have to tell me what the extra dimensions of space are. And there are ways to do this very concretely. And given those extra dimensional spaces, you can ask, does this give rise to structure that's non-trivial and interesting for generic values of the complex structure moduli? A and that's, that's the question here. So it turns out that most known B, bases B, extra dimensions of space, do give rise to these structures. And I'll, and I'll try to quantify that. Uh, a broader question in the context of, of the landscape is if you have an astronomical number of something, to quote a common number 10 to the 500, how do you do anything with such a large ensemble? And finally, uh, the thing that I'm going to turn to at the end of this little vignette is asking, what do you do with these huge gauge sectors? Should they, do they change how you think about cosmology? If you buy these sorts of landscape ideas, should you consider them? How do they constrain you, etc.? Okay, so I'm going to start F theory with an equation, just to remind you, I have a Weierstrass 
equation that describes the extra dimensions of the F-theory compactification, that describes the elliptic vibration that controls the seven brains, okay, where F is, uh, for me, the most general section of minus 4K, where K is the canonical bundle on the base, and G is the most general section of minus 6K. Of course, there are seven brains in the game. F-theory geometrizes seven brain structure, and the seven brains live on a particular locus Delta, which is 4F cubed plus 27G squared, equals zero. So when you think about the space of possible Fs and Gs, and we'll talk about this in a second, as you move around in that possible space of polynomial choices, you see that this hypersurface equation moves around. You're moving in the complex structure moduli space of this variety, and correspondingly, as you move in the space of Fs and Gs, where the seven brains are and what type of seven brain structure you have can change. So, in particular, as you move in, s in the complex structure moduli, that is, by changing these Fs and Gs, uh, the brains can move or if you'd like Higgs or depending on what, how you choose, enhance the gauge group. And Timo's told you all sorts of beautiful things about why you have gauge sectors living on seven brains. Now I want to tell you about how to think about this for large sets of ensembles of seven brains. So, so this is the idea. Uh, remember this idea shows up in, in your string theory courses that if you have two, two D seven brains on top of each other at weak coupling in flat space and you move them apart, you're breaking U2 to U1 times U1 and this seven brain movement is controlling, in controlling this, is controlling this structure. So that's what's happening with F and G here. So I'm going to jump right into non higgsable clusters by giving you the first example in the history of the literature. And the example is this. This is Morrison Vafa 96, Morrison Vafa 1, I believe. And what they did, remember, to specify an F theory model, you have to say what the dimensions of the space are. This is B equals F3, which is the third Hertzebrook surface. If you're familiar with a gauge linear sigma model description uh, of the quintic, for example, you may recognize that you can think about some of these surfaces in terms of a gauge linear sigma model description as well, where you have four coordinates, x1, x2, x3, x4, that, that would be the fields of the gauge linear sigma model, two u1s with associated charges q1 and q2, where for this particular extra dimensional space B, we dis, uh, the charges are 1, 1, 3, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Now, What do you do with this? So given this information about the extra dimensions of B, and there's a little more information that I haven't specified, the natural question to ask, what is the general F theory model on this? What is the most general F and G that you can write down? What sort of seven brain structure does it give you? And so uh, I'm not going to worry about talking about sections of line bundles. Basically, what those conditions on F and G tell you is that F is a degree 20, 8 polynomial in this first, first column uh, charge. And G is a 30, 12 polynomial in this second charge. And so then you can ask, what sorts of monomials, given that we know that it has to be homogeneous, all of the coordinates have to appear on the numerator because if they didn't, there would be poles at some point in the space time and we're trying to avoid those. So, so then given this, what are the most general monomial, what's the most general polynomial you can write down in here? And in particular, there's a question you can ask, is there some monomial that could live in this F that has X4 to the zero? So we're trying to find combinations, products of powers of these, uh, of these uh, homogeneous coordinates that have appropriate scaling 20 comma 8 under this Q1 and Q2. And uh, note that if this was the case, x4 to the 0, uh, then you would have to have x3 to the 8 so that it would be homogeneous in the second coordinate. Right? This would imply that you have x3 to the 8. 
And the problem is, is that Q1 of x3 to the 8 is 24, which is greater than 20. Okay? So if this is greater than 20, that would mean that you would have to have x1 and x2 appearing in the denominator to make it degree 20 in the, uh, in the first scaling variable, in the first scaling relation. And similarly, you can show, so, so this implies that there's no monomial with x4 to the 0. Okay. And similarly, you can do the same analysis. There's no monomial with x4 to the 1. Right? Because if it was x4 to the 1, you would need x3 to the 7, but the charge, uh, the, 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 the charge Q1 of x3 to the 7 would be 21, which is still greater than 20, so you're still running into the same issue. Um, this implies that the most general form of f necessarily has, because you can't have x4 to the 0 or x4 to the 1, no matter what polynomial you write down, you will have to pull out an x4 squared, and then there will be some residual polynomial left over that I will call f twiddle. And similarly, you can do the same analysis for G. And uh, when you do it, what you realize is similarly, uh, G has certain forced vanishing along X4. And uh, the degrees of these are 20, 6 and uh, 30, 10. Okay. OK, so this just looks like some frankly boring exercise about counting degrees of homogeneous polynomials on some particular extra-dimensional space, B3, uh, B, which is F3, the third Hertzebrook surface. The reason that this is interesting is uh, because what you get in the discriminant locus, this F and G uh, forces on you some structure that the discriminant locus is X4 to the fourth delta twiddle, uh, and so in particular, you have some seven brain localized on this coordinate x4 equals zero. And its order of vanishing is four in the discriminant. It's four seven brains piled up on top of each other. And the whole point is that no matter what you do, no matter what f and g you choose, you cannot get rid of this structure. It is something that is totally generic given this space-time f3. No tuning. Okay. So that's a simple exercise, but we should probably talk about physics. Uh, yeah. So wh what is the physics of this setup? Um, the picture, this, the generic picture is that if this is your space, F3, and you have some divisor, X4 equals 0 on it, uh, this delta twiddle is going to give some other seven brain, right? Each component of the discriminant is a seven brain. So there's two seven brains here, one along x4 equals zero, another along delta twiddle equals zero. And the question is, what, how does that delta twiddle intersect x4 equals zero? It's a natural question to ask, do the seven brains intersect or not? And in this case, it so happens that delta twiddle is some complicated thing. Maybe it looks like that. But delta twiddle does not intersect x4 equals zero. Um, this is significant. The reason is, is if you go to this Kodaira classification that Timo's been telling you about, remember that from the Kodaira classification, given the orders of vanishing of F, G, and delta, you can read off the gauge group on a seven brain. Up to this beautiful story about monogamy, but the first approximation, narrowing it down, this is all you need, the order of F, G, and delta. So in this example, the order of fg and delta along x4 is 2, 2, 4. And if you go to Kodaira, what he will tell you is that that corresponds to g equals su3. So physically, what this is telling you is that the picture that you have in your string theory course of brain splitting doesn't work here because there's no flat direction you can move in the moduli space to move the brains apart. The flat direction does not exist, which tells you that the, somehow this su3 theory can't be Higgs. And then the question is, given this picture, why can't the SU3 theory be Higgs? What about this picture suggests that maybe you can't Higgs this SU3 theory? How would you Higgs this SU3 theory? Okay. 
You don't have any Higgses. And you, there's a similar comment over here. They don't intersect. Because they don't intersect, you don't have any Higgses. Right? So there's no... So this is a 60 theory. Uh, there's no hypermultiplets charged under the gauge group. And if there's no hypermultiplets charged under the gauge group, there's no scalars to Higgs on, and you have a non-Higgsable theory. This is why this seven brain sits here for all of eternity, and you can't do anything about it. Okay. okay. So this is a nice story. Um, in the examples of Morrison and Vafa, if you do this with Fn, it turns out uh, that the story generalizes as a function of n, the nth Hertzberg surface, if n is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 12, you have uh, SU3, which is A2, SO8, which is D4, F4, E6, E7, E7, and E8. Why did I write E7 twice? These are actually two different E7 theories. This is an E7 theory that's pure super Young Mills in six dimensions. No matter, can't hex it for that reason. This is an E7 theory with a half hypermultiplet of the 56. It turns out that that representation you also can't Higgs on. There's a notion of, given some matter, do you have a D-flat direction that you can Higgs on? And in, and in this case, the answer is no. So these are, these are the non-Higgsable theories on Fn in six dimensions. Uh, if you'd like, this seven brain on X4 equals zero. So, so the way that you would go from F3 to Fn is just change this to N. And uh, the language is that this is a non-Higgsable seven brain. In uh, 60, in the low energy theory, we know exactly what non-Higgsable means. It means that you can't Higgs it in the field theory. Uh, and basically all of the possibilities have been classified. And the, the two cases are that you have su pure super young mills or the type of matter that you have is in half hypermultiplets of a small enough number that you can't Higgs on it because there's no D flat direction. So, so this is the structure and it's just, kind of cool, this particular space-time, that you, you can't do anything to get rid of this SU3. It's there. All right. Um, yeah? For, for the Hertzebrooks? All of them in 60 or all of them for the Hertzebrooks? So, um, Good. So in six dimensions, the, po the possibilities were classified in 2000, somewhere in the 2010 to 12 time frame by Dave Morrison and Wadi Taylor. Uh, they cl classified, uh, given a certain condition, the toric varieties that can give rise to these. They also classified in complete generality on the basis of the different structures that you can get. Um, and in 4D, it's more complicated. Yeah. Um, but one thing I should note, okay, so I'm not going to write down the full Kodaira table for you here. What I'm going to do is just point out that for this to happen, you have to have F vanishing along some divisor for generic moduli and G vanishing for some generic moduli and then ask what gauge groups in the Kodaira table could that correspond to? And it's a short list. And the list uh, is that on a single non higgsable seven brain, the list is uh, E8, E7, E6, F4, uh, SO8, SO7, sorry for mixing notation, uh, G2, SU3, and SU2. Okay. This list has also appeared in some N equals 2 literature a few years ago. Uh, it's an interesting sequence of Lie groups. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that's the correct number of possibility. Um, if I miss something, any of the experts in the audience, please correct me. All right, so so this is the sort of thing that can happen. Uh, these are the possible gauge groups that you can get non-Higgsable uh, in, in six dimensions and also four dimensions on a single seven ring. Geometric gauge group, and there's, there's some caveats there. But one of the things that's really interesting is that uh, this phenomenon actually happens in four dimensions as well. And uh, since you guys are friends with Inan and, and so am I, I'm going to just give one of his examples. So in 4D, um, you can, so I should also mention that if you have many of these seven brains, each non-Higgsable seven brain could in principle intersect another non-Higgsable seven brain, and it might give rise to something that looks like a cluster, and you might call it a non-Higgsable cluster. So I'm going to show you in four dimensions that you can get quite complicated non-Higgsable clusters. Sorry, what's that again? 
You could in principle, right. So, right. Uh, there could be some, some, some stories of small instanton transitions here. There could also be field theoretic Higgslings. So, the, abs- um, they, they're related, yes. Um, but but, but not, not in all cases. So, uh, so, oh, good. So this complicated example. So Miriam's absolutely right. There's nice physical interpretations of these setups in many of the cases. And uh, here is what one complicated non Higgsable cluster looks like. So each of these nodes is a seven brain. Each decoration on the node is a different gauge group that I will tell you what it is in a second. Thank you, Yinan, for providing this example in your paper with Wadi. Okay. Trying to be careful about the decorations. So keep in mind that each one of these things that I'm drawing is a seven brain with a non-abelian gauge group. So there's some particular complicated topology on B that gives rise to this structure. There's another disconnected component. Sorry, and uh, two seven brains that intersect, I'm drawing uh, a link between the nodes. Okay. Um, And now I'll tell you what these are. This is SU3. So vertical slash means SU3. Uh, Undecorated means SU2. Uh, there's things with X's and there's four of them. Those are F4. Uh, there's okay. G2's and then the ones decorated that are filled in, this is SO8. Okay, so this is a complicated gauge sector. Here's a disconnected component, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten disconnected components of gauge sectors. A bunch of them are just single seven brains that are sitting there. Here's some non-trivial structure. Here's two that are intersecting. And here's some very, very complicated seven brain sector. Yes. Absolutely. You can do that here, but that's an operation in M theory, one dimension lower. Yeah. So, um, Right. Put, it, put in the language of the gauge theory. I'm dealing with the six dimensional or the four dimensional gauge theory. If you compactify that to one dimension lower, the dth component of the gauge field becomes a scalar, and that gives you a new scalar that you can Higgs on that moves you to the M theory Coulomb branch. Yeah. Good question. Great question. All right. So this is part of the motivation. If you get this complicated structure in 4D, the question is how general is this complicated structure? What sorts of structures do you generally get? Can you be systematic and and try to say something? And then, of course, this is without fluxes. So in particular, fluxes can can alter the stories in a couple of ways. Um, What I'm giving you is first the geometry. So that is not sufficient to specify an F-theory compactification. Sometimes you have to turn on flux. Fluxes can stabilize moduli, so they could uh, they, should, they could enhance you to some sublocus in the moduli space of allowed Fs and Gs that would enhance this generic structure beyond what, it would, what would exist at generic values. There can also be fluxes that can break down the gauge group. And of course, as, as Miriam and Timo have studied uh, and have beautiful works on extensively, they can generate chirality, which of course is important for realistic gauge sectors in four dimensions. What I'm giving you is sort of the foundation of a house that we're building where the rest of the house critically depends on flux. But you have to have a geometry. All right. So I'm going to tell you about a construction now. And then we'll talk a little bit about dark sectors. So in this construction, we'll want to ask, what extra dimensional spaces B can you get? And there's a certain, did Laura talk about toric varieties and polytopes? Okay, cool. Um, so what's a toric variety? You know what projective space is. The quintic sits, sits in P4, but there's also weighted projective spaces where that one scaling relation of the quintic, the coordinates scale differently. That's a weighted projective space. A toric variety, it's a first approximation, says don't only generalize the weights, have there be more relations as well. So there's not just one scaling relation, there's multiple, and each one can have different weights of, under the different fields. In fact, F3 is itself a toric variety. You see two scaling relations with different weights. If this one wasn't here, you would call that a weighted projective space. So, um, for example, CP3, the charge and the fields, X1, X2, X3, X4, 
It's just one, 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 one. And uh, these are in one-to-one -one correspondence. Well, not quite. There's, there's some qualifiers on the geometry. With uh, convex holes of certain vectors living in <coughs> Z3 in this case, where uh, these vectors V1, V2, V3, V4, in this case, are uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. So how do you see the relationship here? Well, so the Qs are actually uh, the, the kernel of this matrix over here. So in particular, if you take that vector with coefficient 1 and add it to that vector with coefficient 1 and that vector with coefficient 1 and that vector with coefficient 1, you get 0. And hence, uh, hence, this charge vector is in the kernel of that matrix. So what this means is it gives you a geometric way to think about these uh, normal ways that we think about projective spaces as some scaling relation. You can think instead of it in terms of some three-dimensional polytope uh, as with the other lecturers, I will say apologies for the drawing. So this is some three-dimensional thing. The origin is sitting somewhere in here and you uh, connect the rays to the origin in some way like that that doesn't look so good. But so the basic point of this is that this gives you a way to think about varieties in terms of some geometric object sitting in 3D. And in particular, here you could ask x1 equals xi equals 0 would be a divisor. And that divisor corresponds to some vi. So to every divisor, to every homogeneous coordinate of the toric variety, that's this generalization of weighted projective space, there's some vertex sitting in Z3, some ray. OK, so then the question is, uh, there, there's a certain condition called reflexivity that I won't really talk that much about here. But given a polytope, you can ask, is, and given the fact that this polytope corresponds to some variety that you could compactify F theory on, is there a way to do topological transitions in the space that does some simple operation on this polytope that allows you to uh, have, have simple operations and build up a large ensemble of things by, by having simple operations on the polytope? Maybe I'll leave that there. So so we have these. So CP3 has complex dimension 3. So if I compactify F theory on it with an elliptic vibration over that CP3, I'm in four-dimensional F theory compactifications, right? And um, it turns out there's 4,319 reflexive polytopes, which is a certain type of nice polytope. Oh, yeah, OK. I'm seeing what the issue is now. I have never done it this way. This is cool. All right. <laughs> do all of them real quick in the interest of time. Just they take a little while to dry. While I do this, you guys are all thinking of fantastic questions, right? Okay. I guess it would be more efficient if I didn't alternate every time. So just to recap, the idea is that we're getting at is that for some extra dimensional spaces B, when you study the most general seven brain construction you can on it, you have non-trivial seven brain structure and these can carry non-abelian gauge theories. <coughs> All right. And that's this picture that I'm erasing now. And these extra dimensional spaces, if they're toric varieties, certain nice toric varieties are in one to one correspondence with certain polytope objects. OK. Sorry, Yunnan, to erase your beautiful picture. 
All right. Maybe that will dry on its own. All right. So, so what we're trying to get at is topology change from polytope operations. So if I wanted to generate a large set of extra dimensional spaces B, you could do topology change of two basic types. So if you have a three-dimensional object like this, uh, let me draw an interior point because that's what I'm, let me draw an interior point there. You see that there's this co-dimension one face of this polytope that looks something like that, that has this interior point, And it turns out that to have a smooth variety, you actually need to triangulate this thing. So this here is what I'm drawing here. And uh, the interior points I'm drawing for each of these, uh, you can, it's, it's, it's a V. And so there's divisors associated with every single one of these. And I'm going to triangulate this. And there's two basic things that I can do. So remember that this is some, something sitting in 3D that I'm putting on a plane. So when I study this segment here, this is actually sitting between some V1 and V2. And the operation that you can do is to add V1 plus V2 which there were two divisors there before, but I just added another one. There's a new vertex. This is a blow up along the curve that is the intersection of these two divisors. So that's one type of operation. The other thing I can do, and this is that, is I could take a little triangle, right? I could take this triangle and try to draw this in 3D. All right, here's my little triangle. I have the origin here. And okay, fine. so what I can do, if this is V1, V2, and V3, I can add something coming up here that's V1 plus V2 plus V3. These are technically uh, smooth blowups of the torque variety, at, uh, of the original torque variety B at, along a curve that is the intersection of these two associated divisors. It produces a new divisor, and that changes the topology of the space. But you can still have an F-theory compactification on these. Similarly, this is a blow up at a point. So you had three divisors, the divisors associated with V1, V2, and V3 intersecting. And at that point in the toric variety, you can do a blow up. And this is the sort of operation that happens in this polytope picture. This is a really inconvenient way to picture it because drawing three dimensional things is harder than drawing two dimensional things. So what I'm going to do is take these two operations and view them face on. And what I'm going to do, so take this and view it face on so that these, these, and these all project down. And this is V1 plus V2, this is V2, and this is V2 in this face on way of viewing it. I'm going to label this as one, this as two, and this as one, where the two here is because it's a coefficient of one and a coefficient of one. So, um, so, so that's something that we're generally going to need to keep track of in this particular construction. Similarly, if you take this face on and project down, what you will have, something like this. The details of the operation, I, I should say this at the beginning. The point here is not that you understand every detail of the mathematics. The point here is that I'm showing you a way which you can systematically construct an enormous ensemble of things, gain control over it, and talk about the physics of it. Okay, so if that's 1, 1, 1, that's V1, V2, V3. V1 plus V2 plus V3. Uh, this gets a 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is a 3. And generally speaking, if I have some uh, new vertex associated with some topological transition of this type, I'll say it's A, V1 plus B, V2 plus C, V3, then you might define the height of this, which is roughly measuring how high above the initial facet it's sitting as A plus B plus C. Okay, and the point of this, in part, is that you can keep going. So, is that you can keep going. So you don't just have to add one, you can add many. Just 
try to get the, the, the 3D geometry of what I'm doing in your head. Um, as long as a certain eight, uh, as long as the heights are less than or equal to six, that's a simple sufficient condition. And so what you might get is you maybe originally had two vertices like this, but you added a ton in here, right? And so these all are new divisors that can have new structure in the F theory compactification. And in particular, seven brains can live on them. Okay, so what I'm giving you is two operations by which you can change your variety and have a new compactification that is related to the first one. You can ask how the physics changes when you do this. So just to refresh, there are two basic operations. One is a curve blow up by which I have some two intersecting uh, triangles and you, they get replaced like this. So if this has height A and this has height B, then the new vertex here has height A plus B. And also a point blow up. Both of these are different types of topology changing transitions. So you could add the vertex. So remember this is going into the board. There's three vertices there. If you add all three of them, there's something out here and then you smash it down into the board and you get something like this. These are the two basic operations. If this is A, B, and C, this is A plus B plus C. And in doing this, I've changed the extra dimensions of space. You can ask how the physics changes, but change the extra dimensions of space, and I'm developing an algorithm by which to generate a large ensemble systematically. So, Physics results are following in like five minutes, and then we'll talk about some cosmology. So what do we do? Let's think, for example, there, there, so then if we start with two basic types of trees, so, so I'm going to use some language, because I don't want to say exceptional divisor or topology change over and over and over again. What I'm doing is I'm adding ver vertex structure in 3D in a way that looks like it's building a tree above the original ground where each of these leaves in the tree has some height above the ground and the physics is going to depend critically on this. Yeah. Yes. So, very good. Um, that's an important question. So, to any base, you'll have some set of VIs, right? And as I do these topology changes, I'm getting more and more and more VIs, right? But at, for any fixed base, you have some set of VIs, and I'll define delta F, sorry, this is off the cuff, to be um, those monomials in Z3 such that Z3, such that M dot VI uh, plus four is greater than or equal to zero for all the i. And delta G is defined to be M in Z3 such that M dot VI plus six is greater than or equal to zero for all i. And then the monomials that correspond uh, so good. So, so this just defines some points sitting in Z3. From these, you get the monomials. So if I have some MF in delta F, this maps to a monomial via product over I XI, the homogeneous coordinate associated with the VIs, raised to the power M dot VI plus 4. Okay. And uh, similarly, you can do this for MG. Sorry, this is a little bit of a long technical answer, but this is super systematic. Notice that by this condition, all of these are appearing with non-negative expo exponents, which is important for having this be well-defined on the variety. And so given these monomials defined in this way, you construct the most general F and G you can out of those monomials. And then you have the most general F and G allowed by the particular space. But if you do one of these transitions, you have an extra VI that gives you an extra hyperplane that might cut out monomials that were existing before and might change the structure of the gauge group. So the basic way is that there's, there's these polytopes delta F and delta G whose elements map directly to monomials that allow you to construct the most general F and the most general G. From that, 4FQ plus 27G squared equals zero, study the structure of the gauge group. Sorry. Do you have any? S 
sorry, uh, how to identify the discriminant? So how do I identify what combinatorially? Oh, good. There may be some locally, given these local operations on the polytope, uh, you may be able to come up with some rules that tell you how the discriminant changes and how the gauge group changes. But generally speaking, it in principle could, de could depend on the whole set of vectors VI, so it may be determined also non-locally. Yeah, so, so there's no simple way I mean, this is, the, this is the direct way to read off the discriminant and therefore the, the seven brain structure and gauge group given, given the set of VIs associated with these blow-ups. That's right. So, sorry. Um, so, so there are extra continuous parameters, but the set of monomials is determined by the combinatorics. And for, then you can ask for generic parameters. When you take these monomials and you sum over them with some coefficients, where those are your complex structure moduli, the parameters, you can ask what is the general structure. Yes? Is it possible to identify the uh, Good. So there are some, there are some consistent, in principle, from the point of view of combinatorics, but not from the point of view of physics. Those won't lead to consistent compactifications. So there are rules, I mentioned it briefly, um, there are rules uh, that need to be followed. The simple one that will be sufficient for what we're doing here is that we never add a leaf with height greater than six. So V is AV1 plus BV2 plus CV3. A plus B plus C less than or equal to six is our condition. And given that condition, F and G will always be non-trivial. Great question. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's a little, a little bit more complicated than that. Yeah. I can tell you after. Yeah. It, it's, it's not, uh, th this is a very important technical point for the sake of the construction, but it's not critical from the point of view of the physics, which is what I really want to get to. Yeah. Sure. I, I'm blowing up. I'm blowing. I'm blowing up a smooth variety to a smooth variety on smooth curves and also on points. Everything's smooth. Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. Um, in some cases, they do. The subvarieties that you blow up may be contained inside the discriminant, and then you can ask, how does the structure of the gauge group change? And this is how you do it. Yeah, that, that's a good question. So that can happen, yeah, for sure. It's just not easy to read off from this picture. You have to map from that picture to this picture. All right, so, so let me just say that um, just in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is to get to, the, get to the physics. So it turns out sometimes you have polytope facets that are very large, okay? So this is a particular facet of a particular polytope that actually exists in four dimensions, and you can, you can use these two operations, curve blowups and point blowups, systematically to build up large ensembles. Okay, all right. Okay, well, I am not good at drawing. <laughs> uh, good, all right, so it looks something like this. And then you have to triangulate this thing uh, for the sake of smoothness to start with a smooth variety. Okay, so I'm triangulating it. And uh, for those that are interested after, the numbers I'm about to give you, in some certain cases, I will prove them after. But this is really about how string theory affects how we think about particle physics and cosmology, not about the particular construction. So given this is one of these facets of these polytopes, to any one of these edges, I can do operations like this. To any one of these triangles in here, I can do operations of this type, and I can iterate them, okay? So let me call stuff I add in here. So if, if, if I'm building up structure like this, and I'm calling them leaves, you might say that this whole set of things together forms a tree. 
And the ones that are added on the interior of triangles, I'll call them face trees. And the ones that are on the edges of these triangles, I will call them edge trees. And then given this condition that you add only leaves of height six or less, you can ask, what are all the different possibilities? And in particular, if the height is less than or equal to uh, four, five, or six, the number of edge trees and the number of face trees grows rapidly. I just want to show you the growth. So uh, this is 10, 50, 82, 17, 42, 31, 41,873,645, okay? And afterwards, for people that are interested, I have it in my notes. This case, exactly, it's pretty easy to show that there's actually 17 face trees with height less than or equal to four. The point is not the actual construction. The point is that this is the real condition, height less than or equal to six. And what it tells me is that in this real facet, in this real construction that corresponds to a real torque variety and a perfectly good F-theory compactification, there's 41 million objects you can add to each little triangle, each of which determines a different topology for the base, uh, up to a factor of, of three. Uh, and then you can do this same thing on the edges. And so in particular, this facet alone, there's 82 ways each for each, it turns out there's 63 edges in this facet. So you get a factor of 82 to the 63 this way and 41,873,645. Okay, so you can do the math. You're, quick, you're, you're obviously getting over 10 to the 100. You're getting 10 to the few hundred this way and uh, up, to a, up to a factor of three, that this, is, this is an accurate count. Uh, let me make one more comment. <coughs> is that this is just one facet in a polytope with four facets, and you can add this structure to the other facets as well, and you have to take into account the product across all of these things, and it turns out that there's one other big polytope, and the total number of bases constructed this way, and then I'll take your question, is greater than or equal to, note I am not saying 10 to the sum number of hundreds, I am saying precisely 4 thirds times 2.96, times 10 to the 755 computed because I have a concrete construction algorithm. That's the point. Um, and we'll talk about the gauge groups that you get from these structures and the associated physics right after I take this question. You can also change the yes, you can, exactly. So um, in, a, in a paper with Tian, we actually estimated for this, we estimated for all the 4319 reflexive polytopes how many triangulations there are. As the complexity goes up, you have to use successively less and less uh, precise approximation techniques, but you can still put bounds. The order of the number of triangulations for this big polytope is 10 to the 15. So in addition to this large number, which can arise for every single triangulation of that polytope, there are the ten order 10 to the 15 triangulations of that polytope that raises the number even more. Timo, yeah. Yeah, there's about a factor of three. It's due to the natural Z3 from the rotation of this. So, so it, it's not really clear from the way I drew it, but there's a way to rotate this into itself via Z3. Yes. Usually you hear about yes. Yes. So um, this is a lot bigger. Actually, Yunnan has a much, much bigger number. Um, <laughs> Yunnan's number of flux vacuum is 10 to the 272,000. The <laughs> these, these numbers are huge. But let me let me uh, finish a asking your question. I'll make one more comment. Oh, it was just, does this supersede the 10 to the 500? The, a, a critical point is that these are different types of things. Those fix the extra dimensions of space and change the fluxes on the background. This is the busel pachinsky number, and also Ashok and F. Douglas have beautiful papers on this. Uh, there's there's lots of papers on that. That's fixed geometry. Change the fluxes. This is concrete geometries. Yeah, changing the geometry rather than the fluxes. On top of that, for these, there will also be f uh, different flux choices. Yes, Lance. Great, 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 great. So it's a different type of thing. One thing that I like about this type of thing is because our, con our concrete construction algorithm is so concrete, you can actually be precise about prefactors and exact exponents, and then also the physics, which is what I'm about to tell you about. Okay, um, and I should say that a lot of this is um, motivated by, by work of uh, Yunnan and Wadi, and uh, what, 
what uh, they have that's really nice is they do a Monte Carlo approach and they're uncovering some things that we didn't see and uh, vice versa because ours is very systematic whereas they really have a great Monte Carlo analysis. Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Good. All right. So the reason why I'm actually mentioning my own work a little bit here for the last 15 or 20 minutes is precisely because we were able to concretely construct so many geometries. Um, all right, so that, that's that. So then you ask, given these, via understanding the structure of these trees that you can add, can you say anything about the gauge group and about the existence of non-hinsible clusters? And here are, the, here are the two results that I'll talk about. And then finally, we'll talk about dark sectors. And I'll probably go five or 10 minutes over. So in this, the probability, pardon? Yeah. I can't. Then I will uh, do what I can because <laughs> of the wonderful dinner tonight. So uh, the probability of non hingsable clusters in this setup is greater than or equal to 1.07. Uh, sorry, I wrote this wrong. 1 minus 1.07 times 10 to the minus 755. So this seven brain structure that is forced on you for generic values of the moduli in this large ensemble of things happens with probability one greater than or equal to one minus 1.07 times 10 to the minus 755, which begs the question, is it one? The answer to that is no. We know of cases where it doesn't happen, but there's a very, very small probability window in which this can live and the probability of non hexable clusters is very high. And this is the physics point. This is the remnant. Let me come full circle because this has been a lot of formalism. Remnants are low energy degrees of freedom that string theory gives you, often whether you like it or not. Sometimes they constrain you. Sometimes they give rise to interesting phenomenological ideas. What I mean by remnant is something that is a remnant of the UV theory, not necessarily added to solve any low energy problem. So the gauge group non hingsable on these can be altered by fluxes, but the geometric gauge group is greater than or equal to E8 to the 10 times F4 to the 18 times U to the 9, and I'll say what that is, times F4 to the H2 times G2 to the H3 times A1, which is SU2, to the H4. The rank of the gauge group is greater than or equal to 160 with probability, uh, sorry, this whole statement that I'm giving you here this happens with probability point greater than or equal to point nine 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 five. Okay. Um, let me finish the statement real quick. So U is in the set G two F four E six and H I. Remember, this is coming from this construction where we add these vertices that look like leaves in this tree above this facet. So H I is the number of height I leaves above V123 carrying E8s. And that sounds like a very specific thing, but it actually turns out in this ensemble, it's very, very commonly the case with high probability that on the facets, all of those divisors carry E8, carry E8 seven brains. And there was a question, yeah. Yes, say more about that. Absolutely. So this is a very, very good point. I'm counting, right? So the probability in this set, given counting, this is very discrete. When we do string theory compactifications, there's discrete data that determines certain things that are topological and protected. Then there's moduli stabilization, which determines continuous things, determines the landscape of vacua. And then on top of that, you have to ask critically, is there interesting dynamics that might choose some vacua out of others? So a natural question is, is the we don't know how to answer it now, but is the dynamics that would exist on such a landscape driving you towards generic bases or towards some very, very particular type of base? And we don't know the answer to that. So one absolutely has to be clear that this is counting arguments. This does not necessarily mean that this is what cosmology populates, but it does ask the question, do you populate these bases sort of uniformly or do you end up in some very particular space? One, exactly. The cosmological dynamics are very important and it's not, we don't know how to answer them. All right. Let me get to where I want to go. Um, great question. And uh, I can finish in 10 minutes and then I'll take one or two more. The whole point of this is to motivate large gauge sectors. And I should say that this is just one story that's been developed in the last couple of years. 
For 30 years in string theory, when people study concrete compactifications and large ensembles of them, we often have very large gauge groups. Not often that large, but often quite large. More stuff than we need for the standard model. Yeah. Ab a a a absolutely. Um, th there's a couple of comments on that. It turns out in this ensemble, sometimes you do get E6. Generally speaking, aside from this ensemble, just considering non hexable clusters, you never get SU5 or SO10, but you can get SU3 and SU2. But these are geometric arguments. There's also fluxes that can be turned on, which in, in these contexts hasn't been done totally systematically, that could break down one of these larger gauge groups to SU5 or, 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 or SO10. So it's not known how to think about that yet, but visible sectors are, are possible. The point here is that if there is a visible sector in here, it looks like there's lots of extra stuff too. Yeah. All right. So uh, all right. So just one more board and then I'll take questions. So this is this is a lot of formalism that motivates the idea that in string theory, when you consider these base spaces, but also there's it arises more generally, there's often large gauge groups. And the critical question cosmologically, of course, is, as was pointed out, do we populate those in a way that samples all of those large gauge groups, or is there some very specific dynamics that leads to interesting structures? A and we don't know the answer, but I am counting, and I am telling you something very concrete about this set via counting. Okay, so remnants. This motivates huge, huge gauge sectors. Is this visible with all of this chalk? Okay, good. Huge gauge sectors. Okay. So um, here's dark matter phenomenology 101 for string theorists. Okay. Random dark stringy stuff. is in general not equal to dark matter, okay? Dark matter phenomenology is much more complicated than saying string theory gives you lots of things, maybe that stuff's dark matter, right? In particular, there's, there's lots of constraints, including the amount of dark matter that has been observed, for example, by CMB experiments, uh, and given any of this lots of extra stuff uh, that arises in string constructions, there's two basic questions you wanna ask. One is if you populate it cosmologically, do you get way too much of it, or is there some other constraint that is violated? You can use this to constrain landscape constructions. In other cases, it may be that the way that the parameters fall give you some potentially realistic dark matter candidate. But in general, you cannot just get away with saying, <laughs> there's dark stuff in string theory, can it be dark matter? There's a lot more to dark matter phenomenology, indirect detection, direct detection, LHC, the relic abundance, and effective, the whole shebang, than this. So you cannot just make this leap. <laughs> So I do want to give you one basic thing that might be motivated by this that's been a subject on and off in the literature for 25 years. Yeah, that's right, 25 years. The, the, the paper that I learned some of these things from is a paper by Larry Hall in, in the early 90s. And the cosmological scenario that this motivates is basically some picture like this. If you have some reheaton phi, maybe it's the inflaton that decays, but maybe it's some other modulus that decays that heat, reheats the universe. By reheaton, I just mean the thing that reheats the universe, regardless of whether it's a modulus, <coughs> the inflaton, whatever, whatever it is. The reheaton, of course, whatever is reheating the universe has to go into the visible sector. But and this axis is the dark sector temperature, T prime. But this is motivating a general effective field theory scenario, these large gauge sectors. If the reheaton, inflaton or modulus, is reheating the visible sector, there's a question, is there some branching fraction into the dark sector? 
And if that dark sector is some complicated gauge sector, you might, for example, have some dark gluons. And those, those dark gluons, as, as in QCD, could have, depending on whether or not it confines, uh, whether the beta function is negative, could have some confinement scale where there's some, as Tom says, some poetry that happens where the light degrees of freedom become strongly coupled and get rearranged into uh, dark glue balls or hadrons. Okay, um, and, and then normal stuff can, can happen here. So this is the basic cosmological scenario that, that's motivated. And depending on the construction, there could be many variants of this. Whatever is reheating the visible sector, is there some branching fraction into this large number of gauge groups that exists? And if it is suitably uh, separated from the standard model, as it cools off, there could be some phase transition where the gluons, or if there's matter, other things in the theory, confine into dark glue balls and hadrons that could be left over in the universe today and could potentially be interesting or kill your theory, depending. All right. Um, all right. Maybe just to say and conclude, so I have time for a few questions. In the simplest case of Piriang Mills, In the simplest case of Puriang Mills, the relic abundance of the blue ball uh, looks something like the dark confinement scale lambda over 3.6 EV, 1 over C, where C is the ratio of energy densities of the visible sector to the dark sector. Okay. Now, think about what this C means. This, this arises, alternatively, you could turn it into a temperature statement if you're getting lots of reheating in the visible sector and in the dark sector. So it may be that the way that your modulus or inflaton couples is such that the decay almost entirely goes into the visible sector. That would change this parameter here. But in the case that it's democratic and C is 1, if you have lambda above, much above 3.6 EV, you've oversaturated the dark matter relic abundance. Because the dark matter relic abundance that's observed is 0.12 to some high precision due to Planck. And, and so um, this doesn't seem so bad necessarily, except for the fact that I have just told you that there are huge gauge sectors in string theory. And so if you he reheat lots of them, uh, there might be a wide variety in the moduli stabilized theory of gauge couplings in the ultraviolet. When you run it down, there could be a wide variety of confinement scales, and any one of those uh, dark glue ball sectors in principle could oversaturate the relic abundance. Uh, and so there's sort of this large end problem. Uh, there are ways out that could be considered. Um, one of them is that they could decay, uh, and there are some constraints there. You could have asymmetric reheating, where the modulus or the inflaton that is reheating the universe preferentially, uh, preferentially decays into the visible sector. Uh, you could also have, uh, this was, came out in a paper uh, by Acharya et al. about a month ago, that it, it could be that the reheat temperature of the dark sector just happens to be below the confinement scale, and so you'd never produce those dark gluons in the first place. And finally, there could be mediators. So this is some sort of caricature of a story in string theory that is well motivated by a simple fact from the last 30 years of doing string theory that there are often large dark gauge sectors. If there's a visible sector, there can be large dark gauge sectors. I gave you one example of that formally. I had a very, very large ensemble of uh, F-theory geometries that were related to each other in a connected moduli space. I had a very, very high probability of having non-trivial seven brains for generic values of the moduli, a very, very large gauge group, and it motivates particular string-motivated effective field theories where whatever is reheating the universe potentially decays into a dark gauge sector. And uh, if people are interested, I can say more about glue balls next time. Uh, but that's the basic story, and this is what I mean by a remnant. We didn't ask for this. String theory gave it to us. And the question is, how does it change how you think about particle physics or cosmology? Five o'clock exactly. Thanks a lot. Good. 
So if you had the full, I gave you, like I said, I gave you the foundation. If you had the full construction given one of these geometries, fluxes turned on, as Miriam pointed out, all of the moduli stabilized, then the ultraviolet gauge coupling is set in part by G string, uh, which is order one in most of these non-hexable seven brains, and the volume of the divisor wrapped by the, the seven brain. That sets some alpha UV, and then you run that alpha UV down to, down to IR, and you figure out what the associated confinement scale would be. And, you know, if you're being very precise, you take into account all of the supersymmetry breaking along the way. But, um, yeah, so it is determined geometrically, to answer your question. And in principle, there could be a large, diff a large spectrum of confinement scales. Oh, good. No, that's, that's, that's exactly the question. That is exactly the question. Um, in the scenario that was considered in that particular way out, the reheat temperature was lower then might be considered in other scenarios. So that was what it was. So it was cutting out part of the lambdas that would crush you, uh, but it's not cutting out all of them. So there's still issues even in that scenario. Um, right. And this is the sort of thing that this sort of thinking can motivate. If you seem to run into a problem or if something's interesting, it motiv might motivate thinking about ways out um, or cases in which it might actually give the observed relic abundance, which of course would be ideal. Um, so, so, such large groups, that's right. Such large groups are extremely confining. As you know, in, well, maybe Timo's papers from last week solved all of this. The, the question of the exact spectrum vector-like modes in 4DF theory is, is, is non-trivial. Uh, so that's a great question. A lot of these seven brains are going to be intersecting. So when you turn on fluxes, there is the potential for matter. And that will, of course, affect the running and the confinement scales. So this is all highly flux dependent. But the basic, the basic story is that you might have these large gauge sectors that give rise to dark blue balls or hadrons. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So um, the answer is almost always not. Uh, so of these non-hexable seven brains, I gave you this short list of nine things. Precisely one or two of those gauge groups has a non-trivial weakly coupled type 2b limit, the SO8 and the SO7. The others don't. And so in particular, this, this, all of those, that, that, do not admit uh, geometric type 2b limits weekly, that are weakly coupled. So one of the things that people that like F theory like about F theory is that it's kind of showing you what happens when you move into the M theory star, so to say. And uh, these, do, in general, these do not have type 2b limits. Sorry, say it one more time. Yes. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So, so from the point of view of uh, type 2b, the, the cases that aren't the SO8 and SO7 are mutually non-local PQ7 brains that are piled up onto one another for generic values of the moduli. And it's the mutual non-localness that fixes g-string order one near that. And one can actually precisely compute the value of g-string at these non-trivial non-hexable 7 brains. Oh, exactly. In, in, the one, in, the, in, in that case, there is no obstruction necessarily. The SO8 uh, can go down to weak coupling. Uh, uh, and, and what it is is four D7s on top of an O7. If you would uh, like a gauge theory way of saying this, because these F theory geometries have gauge theory descriptions, uh, a D3 probe of that setup, uh, of, of that SO8, would be NF equals four cyber Witten, which has a conformal manifold that allows you throw, to throw tau down to weak coupling. Yes. Um, so in six dimensions, I think it's safe to say it's completely understood. Um, the cases that are non-hexable in, in, in six dimensions, the, the non-trivial intersecting seven brains, what's happening in the IR is that either you have no matter, which is a possibility, as Miriam's pointing out in these cases, or you have matter that, is, that can't be higged on because you don't have enough degrees of freedom. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so 
all of this is modulo supersymmetry breaking effects and RG flows that can give rise to dynamical symmetry breaking, etc. But at the string scale, this, this is an IR theory with not a billion gauge symmetry. Fluxes can also change the story, but the, the answer uh, in the absence of flux breaking is yes, this is an IR theory with these gauge groups. Oh, this large one? Yeah, so, um, so, so good. What are the, for example, you might ask, what are these 10 E8s? Yeah. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. They're exactly the interior points of that big facet in the biggest three-dimensional reflexive polytope. They all carry E8s. When you do random samples, you actually realize there's a lot more E8s than this. But uh, yeah, I don't know the topology off the top of my head, but from the point of view of the polytope, they are sitting on interior points. So it's easy to, d one can work out what the topology is. I just don't know what it is a priori. Yeah. Yeah. They're definitely torque surfaces, obviously. Um, but as to what particular ones, I don't know. Thank <laughs> you.